So you see this uh, background behind me. Um, that's because I have a PhD in astronomy. And so I have to somehow remind myself of that every once in a while. Um, from my bio, you can see I haven't done any astronomy in over 40 years. So um, I think the first thing I have to explain is this tagline, where normally it would have my affiliation. Um, I've been attending the Internet Identity Workshop uh, for the past 12 years. It's held twice a year at the Computer History Museum in Mountain View. So it's quite convenient for me here in Palo Alto to attend. And when I started going, everything started with identity. I mean, it was like uh, I walked into the 7-Eleven to buy an Icy, and the clerk asked me to prove my identity before he took my money. That was the attitude that I encountered there. And so I started trying to explain to people why you didn't always have to start with identity and you know, made some progress. But it dawned on me to put this on my badge a few years ago. And then all of a sudden people started coming up to me and saying, what does that mean at the Internet Identity Workshop? And I got to uh, make my point to a lot more people. Um, and in fact, I've made so many, so much progress over the past several years that at the next IIW, I think I'm going to say I'm an anti-identity guy. I have enough converts now to, uh, to make that statement. All right, so now for the talk. Computer security is a very big topic. And um, I told Liana if I was going to do it justice, I would have to uh, take me about seven hours. And she said, you folks probably wouldn't stick around that long. So I had to leave some things out. So there's a bunch of things I'm not going to be talking about. So I'm not going to be talking about hardware attacks like Rowhammer or side channels, Spectre, and Meltdown. I'm not going to talk about the kind of protocol errors that led to Heartbleed or escalation of privilege attacks against the operating system. I'm not going to worry about DNS hijacking and other man in the middle attacks or the weak crypto that came from the TLS downgrade attack. Um, that's a lot not to talk about. So what is it I'm going to talk about, and is it worth listening to? Well, I'm going to talk about access control. Now, I contend that without access control, we'd never see any of the other attacks, because the bad guys would be able to do whatever they wanted far more easily. And access control is very simple. It simply asks the question, are you allowed to do what you're asking to do? That's it. That being the case, why are there so many products on the market to help you answer that question? There's dozens of them. Well, the answer has to be that answering that question is really, really hard. But why is it really, really hard? Well, I'm going to try to convince you tonight that it's really, really hard because we're doing it wrong and that we, there's a better way we should be doing it. So let's start with the mess that we're in. And I'm going to give you four examples. I could give you 50, but as I was told, you're not going to stick around that long. So I'll just give you four. The first problem is privilege. So there is a program on your computer that has the power to read all your files and send your secrets out on the internet. That same program has the power to encrypt all your files and make you scramble to buy Bitcoin, um, uh, to buy Bitcoin to get your files back. Even though that program is so powerful, there are people at your work who use that program every day, sometimes for hours at a time. It's not the operating system. So just think for a second about what it might possibly be. Did any of you think that? Solitaire can read all your files and send your secrets out over the internet. It can encrypt all your files and make you scramble to buy Bitcoin. And in fact, almost any program you thought of has that power because every program you run has all your permissions. It's a mess. The next example is sharing. And I'm going to illustrate the problem with two stories. First story, in an emergency, Mark asked me to park his car in my garage. I couldn't do it, so I asked my neighbor to do it for me and told her to get the garage key from my son. So that's the first story, and nobody would think twice about it. 
Here's the second story. In an emergency, Mark asked me to copy a file from his computer to mine. I couldn't do it, so I asked my neighbor to do it for me and told her to get access to my computer from my son. Now that story is so ridiculous as to be laughable. Sharing is a mess. The next one I want to talk about is chaining. Um, I work with a guy who recently retired from Netflix, and uh, he told me that every time you click anything at Netflix, you involve, that click will involve anywhere from a couple dozen to a couple of hundred microservices. Now, that causes problems, but that example is too complex for me to describe here, so I've made up another one. Here I am. Uh, sitting at my television using my voice remote to control both my streaming service and my thermostat. And the first thing I do is I authenticate to the voice service. Uh, think, uh, hey, Google or Alexa, with my very strong password there. And the question is, when the voice service makes a request of one of the other two services, whose authentication does it use, mine or its own? So we'll look at both of those cases. So let's say it's going to use its own. And I ask to see somebody else's viewing history. Now, I shouldn't be able to get an answer for that. So I ask it. And then the, the voice service takes my voice, translates it to the API of the streaming service, and makes the request. Now, if that other person has an account with the same voice service and the stream, same streaming service, the voice service necessarily needs permission to make that request. And so it gets an answer back. And because the voice service has no idea what the streaming service access policy is, and in fact, it would probably be a violation of privacy if it did, it sends the result to me. And now I've gotten to see somebody else's voice service, uh, uh, viewing history that I wouldn't have been able to do had I gone to the streaming service directly. Now, there's a name for this problem. It's called the confused deputy. If you've never heard it, go look it up. The Wikipedia article is, is pretty good on it. But it's quite pervasive under a variety of names. Clickjacking is a confused deputy vulnerability. So is cross-site request forgery. So this approach can't work, can't use the service credentials. So let's say it's going to use my credentials. And I ask to see this particular movie. And for whatever reason, the uh, voice service sends it to the thermostat. Maybe it's been hacked. Maybe it's got a bug. So it sends that request to the thermostat with my authentication. And the thermostat says, oh, Alan wants to change the temperature. And I end up a pot roast. That's something I call the mint.com problem. If you don't know about mint.com, it's a service that will give you a dashboard of all your finances, all in one place, very nice. And all you have to do to get that dashboard is give them their lo your login credentials everywhere you have money. I think that's the craziest thing I've ever heard. I'd never do it. Millions of people have. You're not just trusting mint.com, you're trusting any hacker who can get into mint.com, but that's the way it works. So what we see here is we can't do chaining. It's a mess. And finally, are these managing permissions. There is a move now that we're going to IoT to give every IoT device a strong cryptographic identity, which we can then use for access control. So I'll give you one example. My cleaning lady needs to get in the front door to clean my house, and I have a smart lock. So I give, I, I let her tell her uh, mobile phone authenticate to my door lock so it will open and she can come in and clean my house. And that works just fine until she gets sick. And now she's faced with a dilemma. Either my house goes uncleaned and she's got an unhappy customer or she gives her phone to, the re to her replacement who's going to clean my house. But her phone has a lot more stuff on it than just opening my front door. It's got all her online banking. It's got her Vegas photos. Not a very good situation. So managing permissions is a mess. So, so how did we get into this mess? Now, I'm going to tell you something. If you saw my picture on the announcement, 
the thing I'm going to tell you might surprise you. I know it surprises me every time I look in a mirror. I'm old. Oh, I don't have my animations here. It's too bad. I am old. And um, true story, I was at the RSA conference this February, just before the lockdown, and I went to the men's room. And as I was coming out, I turned a corner and there was this old guy blocking me. And he never made a move. It was a mirror. I'm much younger than I looked like in that mirror. At any rate, how old am I? Well, I'm so old, I wrote my first computer program in 1963. The, my, the program for my PhD thesis is on punch cards and I'm gonna show you that I still have them. There you can see the punch cards. The rest of them are in a, in a drawer in my closet. And I'm so old that I'm an IBM licensed key punch operator. And the day I got this certificate, I went down to the phone company to get a summer job because they were paying a dollar and a quarter an hour at a time when the minimum wage was 75 cents. So I walked up to the desk and I asked for an employment application. And the woman sitting there looked up and laughed and said, ha, we don't hire men. I, I think I have a sex discrimination lawsuit. I'll check that with a lawyer later. So why am I telling you this? Well, what this means is that I lived through all the decisions that got us into the mess we're in. And I'm gonna explain now how that happened. So my story starts with the mainframe. I, I like to think that these two ladies on the right here worked for the phone company. Probably not, but I like to think that. Um, here's the mainframe. It filled the whole room. It used punch cards. Here's the card reader. This tray would hold a whole box of cards like the one I just showed you. Um, it had about one ten thousandth the compute power of your phone, about that same factor on storage and on uh, memory. But that was the supercomputer of the day. Um, and Back then, access control meant you keeping me from fooling around with your cards. And so that lock there was access control and that was all we needed. Now, eventually we got mainframes big enough to hold your stuff and my stuff at the same time. And we needed a way to keep them apart so I couldn't fool around with your stuff. So the first thing we had to do was come up with a way of representing the access policy. And people came up with the idea of the access matrix. Each row is a, represents a subject and each column represents an object. That's the terminology that was used, subject, object. I've shown files here, but objects could be anything, um, not just files, just any resource you wanted to protect, act, protect access control, do access control for. And what we see here is Alice has permission to read file two and file three. Um, she has read write permission to file two and read permission to file three. Now, those old machines were very short on memory, very short on storage. And people didn't like the idea that if they had the whole matrix, they had to store all this blank space. So they compressed it. And they chose to do it along the columns. So this is the exact same data just compressed. And I'm gonna give you a spoiler alert here. This was the fatal error. This is the source of those problems in the four examples I gave you. The way this worked is when Alice wanted to read file three, she'd prove she was Alice and submit a read request for file three. And the system would look up in the access control list for file three that indeed Alice had read permission and it would allow it. Now, Alice would have been pretty unhappy if she had to prove she was Alice on every single request. So people came up with the idea of logging in. We came up with the log on screen. The idea here was everybody gets a, everybody using the, the, the computer gets a unique identifier and is asked to share a secret with that computer, a password. Now, we had no clue what we were doing back in those days. Um, and to give you an example, Peter Neumann told me the first time he went to set up an account on such a machine, 
his attempt failed because with an error message that said his password was already in use. I mean, that was fixed really fast, but it just gives you a clue how, how little we understood about the nuances of computer security. Well, that's what we did and it worked pretty well. But then we got to the client server era. Now, back in those days, a client was a mainframe that got shrunk in the dryer that you could put in an office environment instead of a, a room that needed special environmental controls. And we needed access control for it. And we already had a model on the mainframe. So we just stretched it a little bit to encompass the clients. And what we did was we gave every user in the company a unique identifier. And he had each one of them share a secret with the system now, the whole collection. And that's pretty good. That worked pretty well, except it was really beginning to show the, the very start of oncoming troubles. When I joined HP, my user ID could not be CARP because that had been given to Sid CARP in, California, in uh, Colorado. Now, to the best of my, I never met Sid. I never collaborated with Sid. To the best of my knowledge, Sid and I never used the same computers, but I had to be a CARP for the next 23 years at HP. And I'll tell you right now, it annoyed me no end. That tells you a lot about my personality. So even this little bit of stretching of the mainframe model caused problems. Well, then people said, hey, you know what? It would be really nice if employees of our business partners could use our computers directly instead of asking us to do stuff for them. So first, we just gave all those people unique identifiers, unique usernames on our, on our computers, on our systems, and let it go with that. But that got old really fast. At one point, I heard a talk where a guy from Oracle said that at that time, they had 80,000 employees, and they were managing 300,000 identities uh, of employees of their business partners. That was just unsustainable. They just couldn't do that. So people came up with the idea of federation. What federation does is take that, meta, that mainframe model and stretch it across companies. So you would authenticate in your own company. You'd have your own unique identifier, your unique username in your company. And then that identity would be proven to my company at first through SAML assertions, SAML certificates, now through other things, to my company. And my company could use that to look up at an access control list. Sounds like a great idea. Here is the actual set of steps you have to go through to make one of your services available to the employees of one of your business partners. Is there any wonder that uh, Ping Identity makes so much money? Well, it gets worse. Now we got the internet. And guess what? We stretched the mainframe model a little more. So when you log into AOL, you put in your user ID, your unique to AOL user ID and your password. And when you log into Prodigy, you put in your unique, unique to Prodigy ID and put in your password. And because there's nobody in charge of deciding what your user ID is for every place you log in, it's unlikely you'll have the same one everywhere. And of course, you know what that led, led to, this mess. If you ever wondered why you have 83 user IDs and passwords, it's because we stretched the mainframe model to the, to the internet, but it gets worse. We talk about microservices and the chaining of microservices, we've got a real problem. Now, I remember I showed you this example that explained why microservices cannot work. And yet I said, Netflix uses them for everything they do. So does Google and Facebook and almost everybody else. So what's going on? Remember what I told you, the voice service had no way of knowing the access policy of the streaming service. So the way these companies get around this problem is they run all their microservices in their own trust domain. Google never uses anybody else's microservices. Facebook never uses anybody else's microservices. That way, all the microservices can have access to the user's access policy. 
why is that a problem? Well, there's a wonderful essay entitled I Pencil by Leonard Reed, written in something like 1956, I believe, where he makes the point that nobody knows how to make a pencil. One company provides the graphite, another the wood, a third one, the eraser, and a fourth one, the little widgie that holds it together. And probably a fifth one assembles the whole thing. And his point is that that kind of specialization is absolutely critical to our economy. That we would not have nearly the wealth we have now if every company had to have their own pencil making department and gather, gather the graph, mine the graphite and, and cut down the trees for the wood and all that. Can you imagine what the world would be like if IBM had a pencil making department and HP had a pencil making department and so on? It would be a real mess. The problem is with the microservices, every company has to do everything for itself. It's like it's got its own pencil making department. Now I explained this uh, to, a, to an economist and I said, isn't that a big drag on their bottom line? He said on their bottom line, it's probably a big drag on the country's GDP. It's such a mess. So now we get, get to IoT. And again, this we we're now at the point where we're going to stretch the mainframe model all the way to all these devices in the home. And so now I just bought your smart house and somehow I'm going to have to update 7,382 just access control lists. What's wrong with this picture? This is, this is why things are a mess now because we've taken a model that worked okay for the mainframe at a time when users, for the most part, were running their own programs against their own data, which almost never happens today. Today, you're almost always using some, a program written by somebody else against data provided by a third party. And any either one of those could be malicious and you're at their mercy. So what worked for the mainframe sort of we're trying to use it today in the modern world and it's just not working. So what are we gonna do about it? Well, let's go back to that fundamental flaw. Let's go back to the access matrix and let's do the compression the other way. And this is called a C list. Dennis and Van Horn introduced this idea in 1967. So this is not a new idea at all. So the way it works is when Alice logs in, she gets access to her C list. It might show up as a menu, for example, um, in her UI. And when she wants to read file three, she says, just read the second, the th second thing in my C list. And that gets sent over to the system, which says, oh, this allows read access on file three. No checking that it's Alice, it's just read access on file three and it succeeds. So it's much simpler from the start. Now the C and C list stands for capability. In 1967, 68, that word hadn't been hijacked, but it has by now. So instead, because it's something working on an object in the subject object model, we call it an object capability or an OCAP. And it's very simple. It's an unforgeable, transferable permission to use the object it designates, that's it unforgeable transferable permission to use the object it designates. Now, I wanna ask you to think for a second, have you ever used an OCAP system? Well, have you ever taken your car into the shop? Did you enter the technician's identity into the access control list for your car? No, you handed the, the guy the key. The key is, an unforgeable, transferable permission to drive your car. It's an OCAP. Have you ever written a, read or written a file on a computer? I bet everybody's done that. Well, that's done in two steps. The first step that checks your identity is an open operation, which if it succeeds, gives you a file handle that lets you use it for the mode in which you open the, open the file. So for read or maybe read write. And what you what your system does is every time you go a read, go to do a read from that file, it submits the file handle. That file handle can be transferred to another process on your computer. That is an unforgeable, transferable 
permission to read that file. Most of you have used Google Docs or have gotten a Dropbox link. Well, here it's not unforgeable. Anybody could construct that string and gain access to this particular file. But it's unlikely that anybody would do it without having seen this string. It's probably not going to be, be something you would guess in less than the age of the universe. So um, in this case, what we've done is we've replaced unguessability for unforgeability. But it's a close enough approximation. Have you ever done a Facebook post? Facebook uses something called OAuth, which uses the authorization header of uh, HTTP. So instead of putting this, this un big unguessable secret string in the URL, where it's relatively easy to have it linked, leaked maybe through log files, it's put in the HTTP header where it's less, far less likely to be leaked, but it's the, basically the same thing. Now it's a little bit less of an OCAP because the designation of the object is in the URL and the authorization is in the header. But if you're careful, careful to keep them together, it works the same as, as an OCAP. And if you think all this stuff is impractical, there are 5 million programmers in the Salesforce ecosystem building tools that they are selling, that customers are using, that are written in a, an OCAP subset of JavaScript. So this is all extremely practical. So let's see how each of these problems I showed you works with OCAPs. Well, when I start Solitaire, what does it need access to? Well, one thing it needs access to is to be update my history so I can see if I'm learning and, and solving it faster or whatever. And so we give it an, OCAP, up to, an OCAP to update the history. But we don't give it an OCAP to read my bank information or my Vegas photos or whatever. So we're able to enforce least privilege with OCAP. And we've actually built a system for Windows that work very much like this. What about sharing? Why was sharing such a mess? Well, my friend Mark Stiegler identified six aspects of sharing that we rely on in the physical world that our online systems don't support. The first is dynamic. There's no time to track down a sysadmin to find, uh, to change an entry in an access control list. It's attenuated. Mark didn't have to give me the login credentials to his car. He didn't have to give me power of attorney over his life. He gave me, he didn't have to give me his whole key ring. He simply gave me his car keys. And I could chain that by chase, chaining the, by passing the car keys to my neighbor. And I could even further attenuate by giving her only the valet key. Now, chaining and attenuating are very important. Without chaining, every private in the army is saying, yes, sir, Mr. Trump. And without attenuation, that private ends up with permission to launch nukes. So chaining and attenuation are fundamental to the way our, our, our society operates. Another one is composable. Um, my neighbor could take the car, one car key, the car key for me and the garage key from my son and combine them to finish the operation. It's cross domain. There was nobody in charge of everything. There's Mark's domain, my domain, my neighbor's domain, my son's, son's domain, and it all just works. And finally, it's accountable in a very interesting way. If Mark finds a new scratch on his car, he comes after me. He wouldn't even know who my neighbor is to go after. He comes after me, and it's up to me to go after my neighbor. Now, imagine if he had called up a sysadmin to change an access control list and say, let Alan read this file. Well, what would the log show? The log would show that the sysadmin had made the change, but it would never show that was because Mark asked. And so we would lose accountability. How about chaining? Well, this just works. So if I go to, to get, get the viewing history, I obviously will select my Hulu OCAP. And Hulu will know that I don't have permission to view that guy's viewing history, and it gets rejected as it should. 
or if I go to view this movie, my thermostat won't recognize the Hulu OCAP and I'll be comfortable and don't have to worry about burning up at that temperature. So that just works. And what about IoT? Um, I wanna stop here and tell you a little story. Um, I've been married about six months when my bride, when I knew the honeymoon was over because my bride said to me, I'm mad at you. And I said, oh, hon, what did I do? And she said, guess. And since I was new at that whole husband stuff, I guessed. And she said, that too. Now, I told him telling you that story because I learned two lessons from that. One is don't guess, and I never guessed again. That, that was, that's something I really learned. But I also learned don't, don't uh, anticipate objections from your audience. And I'm gonna break that rule now because people say, how can a normal human being ever manage a gazillion fine-grained permissions? So what I wanna show you now is a mock-up of what I think a sensible UI would be. So let's say you're driving along in your car and you get a flat tire. Today, you'll pull over to the side of the road, you'll call AAA, you'll sit in your car, the truck will come, somebody will chain your tire and off you go. Tomorrow, what you're gonna do is you're gonna go to triple, you're gonna go to the nearest Starbucks because there's always a nearest Starbucks and you're gonna use your AAA app to report the problem. And AAA is gonna give you an icon to put on your IoT desktop that represents your service call. And they're gonna tell you, we need access to your spare tire. And so what you're gonna do is you're gonna click on the icon for your car, for your car key, and it's gonna show you the various permissions. So if my spare tire happened to be in the back seat, I'd use the unlock permission, but I happen to know it's in the trunk. So I'll click on that and drag it over to the AAA icon. And then they're gonna tell me they need to notify me when the deal is done, when the tire is fixed. And so I'm gonna click on my, uh, the icon for my smartphone. And it's gonna say uh, two options, call and text. And let's say I decide I wanna be texted when the, when the car is ready. Now, AAA will presumably keep the text OCAP for itself, but it will delegate, it will transfer the trunk OCAP to the towing service, the company. And that towing company will retransfer it to the driver who's gonna change my tire. And when that's all been done, I will simply click on the AAA, the, the uh, service call icon, drag it off my IoT desktop, and all those permissions will be revoked. Now, I think that's something that a normal human being could do. I, I gave this talk once before, and before I gave the talk, uh, the organizer in, in introduced me to his mother. And so at the end of the talk, I asked her if, you know, as a non-technical person, she thought she could manage this user interface. And she told me that she'd been a sysadmin for 25 years, and she was probably more technical than me. So that was the last time I made an assumption about somebody. Um, but I think my mother could have figured out how to use this user interface. All right, so how are we gonna fix this problem? I think it's really simple. It's no big deal at all. What we're gonna do is we're gonna start over from scratch. We're gonna throw out all our software. We're gonna fire all our programmers and we're gonna only hire new ones who program in Haskell and who can explain what the heck a monad is. And once we do that, we're gonna have them rewrite everything. Now, some people have told me that this might not be practical. So maybe we have to have a plan B. And here's my plan B. Let's start working backwards. We stretched the um, access control model from the mainframe to IoT. Let's start at IoT and fix the problem going backwards. IoT is a ripe area right now because there are very few standards. It's the wild, wild west. Everything is being changed all the time. It's a perfect opportunity to figure out and code up how to do this with OCAPs. 
Next, we can go on to microservices. Um, <clears throat> they're in a good spot right now. There's a standard they can use. Oh, the OAuth standard work, will work quite well for this purpose. And, um, and microservices are being rewritten all the time. So, so you could set up gateways if you had an authentication-based interior. Um, you could set up gateways that would let you do delegations uh, to services running outside using something like OAuth. Then we move on to sharing. Now, Google Docs sort of got it right, but not quite, but because they didn't know that they were really reinventing OCAPs. But once you realize you're reinventing OCAPs, you can make a model that makes sharing work the way we think it should work. And then finally, we move on to the operating systems. Those are the hardest things to change because of all the stuff running on top of them. But fortunately, there's work being done on that right now. So the Cherry effort out of Cambridge University in England and SRI in Menlo Park, California, um, is they have designed capability-based, OCAP-based hardware and an OCAP-based operating system and even OCAP-based applications to run on it. The SEL4 effort out of Australia has built um, a, an OCAP kernel. And then there are other efforts. For example, there's Fuchsia out of Google and Midori out of Microsoft, where people are exploring OCAP operating systems. So there's a chance that we can get, we can fix what's broken. Now, I went to London many years ago, well, long before there were Google Maps, and I got lost. And so I stopped at a flower vendor and I asked her, how do I get to my hotel? And she told me something um, relevant to the problem that we face. Love, she said, if I was going there, I wouldn't start from here. And that's the end of my presentation and I'll be happy to take questions. And everybody's on YouTube, so I can't get any questions. First one was asking about, well, will the slides be shared? Um, I actually have a version of this talk, a video of this talk I've given, but I can certainly share the slides. Um, uh, somebody will just put them up in the meetup for me. Okay, yeah, I have the URL on your website. Right, um, yeah, I think, I think I have this PDF version. It's not exactly this version. I'll, I'll, sharing is a mess, but I'll share them so that they can be shared. I'm actually wearing a headset. I have a, I have a, um, a note here to turn off my computer. Speaker. I actually am using a headset because I don't like wearing a headset all day. This is, this is much more comfortable for me. So any other questions? People are free to uh, contact me at alanhcarp.com. Uh, go to alanhcarp.com to see my website or contact me at alanhcarp at gmail. Um, you mentioned there were a few updates that that you had on some other slides. No, this, this, is, a, this is the correct version. Um, what we found out just before I started presenting was that to use presentation mode on Zoom, you have to share your entire desktop. Unfortunately, the um, unfortunately the uh, uh, version that we're using, the webinar version, doesn't have an option for sharing your entire desktop. You can only share a window. All right. So I see a question here. What is Earth Computing and what is it building? Um, from my background, you might have noticed that I've done a lot of different things over the years. And I'm still trying to figure out what I'm going to be when I grow up. So Earth Computing is a networking startup that has a completely new way to build data centers that solves a lot of the problems that happen today in data centers at, at the network layer. They just simply don't happen. Um, and if anybody out there is a VC, we're actively looking for funding. Any other questions? I've got the Q&A window open. On the shared screen, if you, um, yeah, if you go up, uh, if you can see the menu either at the very top or the very bottom, uh, there's a Q&A button. There's a question on YouTube here. Uh, I was wondering, uh, 
uh, what's a good technical tutorial for OCAP? Yeah, unfortunately, um, we don't have a very good one. And we keep putting off writing one. Um, uh, Mark Miller's PhD thesis, if you go to eRights, E-R-I-G-H-T-S dot org, um, his PhD thesis is the most comprehensive. It's a PhD thesis, so there's a lot of stuff. Uh, you can go there. Um, this, I, this talk, I've been told, uh, one of my uh, colleagues says he uses this as his, as uh, when people ask him for an introduction, it's actually this talk. And uh, I have a, a video of the, the version I gave at Stanford as well. So we can, you can use that. Um, Chip Morningstar has written something. I think it's uh, too long to be a, a good gentle introduction. So we're trying to get Douglas Crockford to write one. I have to, I forgot to poke him. I was gonna do that today. By the way, Mark Miller's thesis is a delightful read and he's got a lot more in there than just OCAPs. There is uh, some other questions in chat here uh, from Stuart. Uh, would you comment on role-based access and how that might apply for the general logins and access that your talk has covered? Yeah, um, role-based access control was supposed to be the answer to all the problems that came from using identity and trying to manage all the permissions. The uh, problem with you doing it that way is two people in the same rule need mostly the same permissions, but slightly different ones typically. And so what happens is, and I've confirmed this with other people, every RBAC system that's been deployed for any length of time runs into the problem of role explosion. Every time you, the roles don't quite match the permissions somebody need, you end up creating a new role. This happened at HP and uh, one of my colleagues, uh, a mathematician worked on the problem. They, HP at that time had almost 900 roles in the company. And uh, he was able to reduce that to about 250 at the cost of minor over-provisioning. Most people got more permissions than they actually needed. So that was one of the problems. But role-based access control is quite good. When Alice logs in, how do you know what OCAP she should get? Well, her role is a good starting point. And then you can just add whatever ones are missing from the role ad hoc. The other thing about any form of authentication-based um, access decision, that's something where I have to authenticate my identity, role, attribute, some property of myself when I make the request, and that's used to make the access decision. One problem with that is delegation. How do you delegate? You know, that problem with Mark trying, trying to get a, my trying to get access to a file that, that Mark had um, when I wasn't the owner of it. How, how, how can I get that when Mark can change the access controllers? Delegation is a very serious problem. And then there's a further problem. If you have the sysadmin do it for you, there's two problems there. When you tell the sysadmin to revoke the access you delegated, how does the sysadmin know you should be allowed to do that? And secondly, what if I was given that permission from you and from someone else? When you tell the sysadmin to revoke my access, I lose, the, I lose both the ability to help the other person. So that's, that's a real mess and OCAP solved that. But whatever mechanism you want, you can use access control lists, role, uh, roles or attributes, um, but use it to decide what OCAPs the user gets rather than using them to make the access decision. We have a question from Eugene. He says, with the multitude of websites and applications, what would be the best way going forward to authenticate users in an easy way, easy to use way that can be revoked in case of identity theft. In general, how to deal with how easy identities can be stolen and used to gain access to websites and applications. So there's one, we, we've actually, Mark Stribler and I actually built a prototype of this where um, there was no user ID and no password. 
you went to your bank and you set up your account and they gave you one of those unguessable URLs to bookmark. That was it. When you wanted to go to your account, you just clicked on the bookmark. There's no place for a phishing attack there. Or if you get a phishing email and you click on the link, they're going to take you anywhere interesting. Um, now, at that time, there was a risk of, um, you know, the uh, leaking of that secret URL, and OAuth has addressed that particular problem. But Mark Stigler came up with the idea of using that unguessable uh, URL as one of two factors. So when you click the link, it took you to your login page. And you had to be have both the link and the password to get into your bank account. So that's that's one thing we can do. Um, I think there are, there are others. Uh, there we're now moving to this thing called decentralized identifiers. Um, we now have the two-factor authentications with the uh, thing you know the thing you put on your key ring. The Yubi key is the one I have. Um, and those are all helping uh, to prevent that kind of identity theft. Now I see a I see a question here. If all systems use OCAP, how many instances of OCAP is needed? <clears throat> is it possible to use one namespace for all these instances? Um, if it was possible to use one namespace for all these instances, I don't think we should do it. It's too much global coordination. You have to be able to say what it is you want to operate on. Right now, you do that by saying, I want to operate on file foo.txt as a string. It's no difference of just pointing to the OCAP that in your UI shows up as foo.txt. And under the covers, there's an OCAP that invokes it, that, that get, that's get used in the invocation. In fact, we built a file sharing service. We called Scoops, Simple Cooperative File Sharing, the F was silent, that did exactly that. And it was so simple to use that one of our Users asked us how to turn on security, even though it was there the whole time. And in fact, there was no help button on the tool and nobody asked for one. Now, so each resource will have an OCAP for every separately revocable use of it you want. So if you give me an OCAP, I'm free to pass it on to somebody else. But if that OCAP gets revoked, we both lose it. If you want to give the same OCAP to two people, maybe we're working for the same company. When the contract ends, you want to revoke. That's a perfect way to do that, the same OCAP for both. But if you want to be able to revoke mine when I get fired and leave the other one in place, then you have to have a separate OCAP. So I hope that answers the question. There's another one here. How do security keys help? So I mentioned the, the YubiKey that I use. Um, I only wish that more websites accepted it. <clears throat> so you know the two-factor authentication where they send you a text with a, with a six-digit code that you, you type into the browser? Um, that's relatively easy to break if you can get a man in the middle. And the easiest way is via a phishing email. So if I get an email that seems to be from my bank and I click on it, I see my bank's login page. But it turns out it's really being run by the bad guy. And so I click on send me a code, and the bank sends me a code, and I enter that into the window. And the bad guy just forwards that to the bank, and the bank can't tell it's not me. So that works OK. It blocks some attacks. You know, somebody's simply stealing my password, but it doesn't block the man in the middle version. The security keys do. The security key is something that I plug into my computer. And there is a protocol between my computer and the service I'm invoking that isn't subject to man in the middle. And it isn't even subject to hijacking uh, from software on my machine because the good ones require a physical contact from the user before they start the protocol. And so on your YubiKey, you'll notice it will say, Touch your YubiKey to start, or whatever that message is. So that, that helps a lot. Um, another question is, how can Beyond Corp help? Well, Beyond Corp is a brand name from Google. 
And all it is is what's called zero trust these days. The idea is very simple. And it, the, we used to put a firewall to separate our enterprise environment from the rest of the world. So we had an inside and an outside. But that doesn't work real well with bring your own device and working from home and VPNs and all this and that. So people decided that the right thing to do was not get rid of the firewall, but put them everywhere. Every machine has its own fire. Every virtual machine has its own firewall. That's the zero trust model. And Google has built a bunch of tools around that to simplify permission management. Now they're still using the mainframe model for access control, but they could equally well use all that machinery for determining who should get what permission to distribute OCAPs. I have another question here from YouTube. Okay. Um, the C list, uh, oh, maybe it's not a question. The C list is what you use on Android. Is that? Uh, no, not quite. Uh, what, so remember I said on that um, solitaire, the second time I showed it, that we had something that works sort of like OCAPs. Um, that's what Android is doing. Basically, uh, what we did with, with that was we gave every application a separate user account. So when you launched Microsoft Word, it ran in a user account that didn't have all your permissions. It only had permission to access the file you were editing. We did that. That's pretty much the way Android and iOS separate the applications. They each have their own security environment um, rather than, than using either ACLs or OCAPs. At least, at, at, let me be careful here. The last time I looked at, at how this was done was three, three or four years ago, and that's how it was done then. I don't believe it's changed. Um, there's another question here. What is your recommendation on the text-based password versus biometric-based authentication? Uh, biometrics is better. <clears throat> um, it, it makes it harder to share credentials, that's for sure. Uh, I don't know. I mean, I use it on my phone, put my thumbprint. Uh, so it's, it's certainly convenient. Um, but I like to, you know how people describe the th three things of, for authentication is something you know, something you have, and something you are. I describe those as something you'll forget, something you'll lose, and something that will change. Um, there are issues with biometrics if they're not done carefully in terms of privacy, in terms of hijacking. I believe that we now understand how to do biometrics well enough that they're good, they're good for all but the most secure applications. Just my opinion. Any other questions? All right. Well, I wanna thank everybody for giving me the opportunity to put on a real shirt. It's been weeks since I put on anything except a ratty t-shirt. So thank you. Thank you very much for speaking. Thank you, Dr. Karp. Has any more questions from anyone? There's one more actually here um, on YouTube. Go for it. Uh, what do you think of security in general if one sticks uh, in full to Apple ecosystem? Um, so Apple security um, is better than many platforms, but it was for many years protected by uh, being 5% of the market. That's not true anymore. And we are seeing more viruses. The fact of the matter is that on a Mac, on a Linux box, on a Windows box, every program you run has all your permissions. And that's the fundamental flaw. Now, it appears that the Mac apps have fewer vulnerabilities but it doesn't mean that they don't have them. And once one application is breached, all your stuff is lost or potentially lost. Okay, um, just one thing here. I apologize to everyone. It turned out that uh, it looks like it was my computer that was causing the echo. I'm sorry about that. Hopefully the YouTube recording will uh, not have that and we can post that. Okay. And you need to go back to Zoom and let me use presentation mode on the webinar version.
<laughs> yeah. Okay. All right. Thank you. Thank you. All right. Let's see. Going to end this then.